It's been a it's been a few years since I've been presenting regularly, so uh, cheers. Um, my name's Steve. I'm a chartered engineer. I've been uh, writing computer software in various ways since I was 16, so it's, uh, it's been a few years. Um, I've been developing mobile apps since about uh, 2005 when I was working with uh, J2ME handsets. And we were all getting hot and sweaty about J2ME mid P2, which allowed for HTTPS connections so you could use it for serious business applications. Uh, oh, uh, like things like the Sanyo 7400, if you remember that, pre-iPhone. Uh, so then the iPhone came out, and I took an interest in that when the SDK came out, because it's sort of wow. a personal computer of the, of the 21st century. And uh, now you don't have to convince people, but I remember when you had to try and convince people that the internet was going to be a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the web, and then it was uh, mobile phones and uh, apps and so on and so forth. So we moved through a few phases like that. Perfect. I've been working with uh, React Native since uh, about 2016, and um, I, uh, I've been on a bit of a mission to encourage people to consider cross-platform mobile application development technology. Um, the, the reason for that is that a lot of companies can't afford to field an Android team and a, an iOS team and a a few years ago, people were worrying about whether they need a Windows Mobile team as well. And um, so it really meant, meant that uh, proper mobile application development was something that was only in the reach of larger companies that could uh, care for teams of that kind of size. And one of the things that I've observed in the software development industry is that our tools are becoming more and more powerful to the point where an individual uh, or a small team can uh, punch well, but they're like, that's really one of the things that, um, that React Native makes possible. <laughs> so I will dance around my slides. I'll probably take things ahead of time. That's how you'll, you'll, uh, you'll get a feel for uh, how, how my mind works as I go through this. So um, the kind of people who are interested in this, um, and perhaps you could give some sort of indication about if you fill into any of these categories, are web developers who are just interested in mobile apps. Um, native iOS or Android developers who are thinking that's what it would take to be able to develop apps on the other platform that you might have specialized in. Uh, JavaScript developers, probably plenty of those around here, who want to leverage those skills in more ways than, than perhaps in the, in the past. And maybe you're just curious about React Native, you've heard about it, and you just want to know what's going on. So welcome to all of you. Um, why would someone choose React Native? I've already covered a couple of these points. but um, it's uh, a really high performance um, platform which allows you to develop high frame rate mobile apps which are more or less indistinguishable from native applications, but written in JavaScript. The architecture of a React native application is that uh, what you end up with on each of your target devices is a native application which carries a JavaScript bundle, which it then runs. Uh, to control native components which are presented to the user. Uh, and there are a lot of optimizations that take place within the application, which mean that uh, you're not really aware of the fact that you're running JavaScript code most of the time. But you get a lot of benefits because your Android native application is running the same JavaScript bundle as your uh, iOS native application. Um, while there might be some conditional code in there to uh, determine which platform it's on and behave in a way which is uh, more appropriate for a user of Android who might not like looking at a, something that, that looks like it's more a home on an iOS device and vice versa. Uh, generally, you can get away with writing a single code base, which covers most of the functionality which you which your users will, will cover. And that's part of the strength of the platform when it comes to letting small teams or individuals produce software that much larger teams would have had to uh, would have been needed for in the past. Um, the other thing is, of course, you, you can develop it 
uh, the same, this kind of single code base can serve not just smartphones, but also tablets as well. So if you had aspirations of having your app work on an iPad, then it's a relatively small step um, to have your, your app cover that, that as well. Uh, Bill, don't really talk about Android tablets so much anymore, but of course that's also a possible a possibility. Yeah, Apple's just too successful with the iPad. Um, so the key point of all this is that smaller companies can afford mobile application development that would be possible otherwise. You don't have to be the size of any New Zealand to produce a world-class mobile app when you've got this kind of framework uh, available to you. Uh, who do you think? Well, a lot of big companies. Um, we've really moved beyond the point where you have to justify picking React Native because it's sufficiently well known and there's, there, are, there are enough big high-profile companies using it that we've re really moved out of that. But just for the sake of it, I'll just cover off a few. So you've got things like uh, Pinterest, uh, Skype, uh, is that SoundCloud? Yes. Facebook themselves, Tesla, Uber, they, um, Instagram. They, these are all using uh, React Native technology to produce mobile apps. Yes. So, realestate.co.nz <laughs> is going to be uh, launching a, a React Native app very soon, which uh, we, we hope to impress people with. So, how do you get started? Um, I've got my favorite courses and recommendations that I make, and uh, I'll, I'll make these slides available to you so you can use these links directly if you like. Um, the, the documentation for Facebook is first class. So it's a reasonable place to go if you have any questions about how the, the framework should be best used. Uh, one of the courses which I routinely recommend is from Udemy, it's from a guy called uh, Steve Grider. And I think I paid $10 for a Udemy course. You should never pay $200 for a Udemy course because they're on sale so often. So I paid my $10 for this course when it was on sale and it's been updated uh, every few months since then. So that, that's relatively small investment has uh, given me access to a course which is covering all the latest things which are being added to the framework over time. So it's um, it's it's uh, name now is the React Native at Hooks course because Hooks have been added to React and that everyone's hot and about that. Um, and I expect that this course will continue. So uh, if you have 10 or $15 spare, then I recommend spending it on that course. Um, any of you AK.io subscribers? Um, I found them quite good as well. They've got lots of very short videos which explain succinctly how to um, perform uh, various tasks. I think the yeah, yeah. They're, they're very good. They, they don't waste a moment though, so mm -hmm. sometimes you have to watch the videos two or three times to have it sink in. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it's like when you're watching uh, an Aaron Sorkin uh, uh, TV show where the, the dialogue is all quite accelerated, they don't waste a second. You think, wow, these guys must be so smart. Um, I think the guys from OKED are pretty smart. Um, there are too many YouTube channels to mention, but uh, if I had to pick a favorite, then it'd be uh, uh, a guy called uh, William Candelon. I keep wanting to say Candelion, but uh, he's French. Um, he's got a, a uh, YouTube channel uh, called Can It Be Done with React Native? And he picks on uh, famous applications which are doing something really interesting in the UI and says, I bet I can do this in React Native. And then he figures out how to do it and show you. Uh, and some of the sample code which I've got here benefits from some of the examples which it is provided. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, let's have a look at some code. Um, it's always a bit risky doing live coding. And I've got, uh, I've developed a small app which shows off a few different concepts with React Native. Um, you're, you're sitting near the back, and I'd encourage you to drift forwards if you want to be able to read what's on the screen, because uh, it might be a bit hard otherwise. Um, so this app is a tab-based application. There are a number of different tabs which show off uh, how to do a few different things. I'll, I'll just uh, rather than template too much, I won't do live coding on more complex things, but I'll show you what the code looks like just so you can feel for what React Native is like to play with. Um, We've got a very simple animation for the simplest way you can do an animation in React Native. So I'll take you through how that works. Um, we've got something called a shared element transition. So it's where you've got two screens mm -hmm. and there's a single element on one screen. And when you navigate through to the second screen, it kind of wow. animates into position. Oh, that's impossible. And the, the, uh, the best example of that is uh, if you're familiar with the iOS App Store app. Uh, that makes some good use of that. So you'll see a, 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 
a series of cards with a nice little graphic for each of the apps that yeah. you might select. When you, when you click on it, it takes over the top half of the screen. And, and I like to think that uh, that's what people expect of mobile apps these days, and Apple's kind of leading the way. So I've got a single how to do that. Okay. Um, we've got a little example about how to use an API. And I have to warn you that uh, the providers of this Chuck Norris Jones API, uh, while we bear no responsibility for the content, occasionally there's a launching one that comes through, so you'll just have to squint your eyes and fit that oh, yeah, sure, sure. in the demo. Um, uh, but you do, in a few lines of code, you can just fetch data from an API and, and represent it in, in the, um, mm -hmm. the UI where it made that up. So I'll show you how easy that is. Uh, I cheated on this one. You can get engines for a lot of different games in JavaScript. Uh, you, you actually get a, an award-winning chess engine. So you can produce a chess application just by taking this library and writing enough code to present the UI. That's what I did with this little tic-tac-toe engine. So just a few lines of, of uh, JavaScript code, and I was able to present uh, the results of that. So we can have a look at that. Can okay. I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, is, that a, is there a website where you find these engines, or it's just a GitHub and you use um, the engine React Native? Or? You can generally find what you're looking for on NPM. So, yeah. Um, uh, but I tend to um, Google around for things anyway, just because um, sometimes people don't get the press they deserve. And uh, often I find medium articles or YouTube videos which explain how to use a library where someone's got the trouble of explaining uh, how much work they put into something. And, and that's sometimes the best way to find some of the most interesting libraries that you can use with React Native. Uh, I didn't actually describe that. Um, it's a simple form with an animated header. When you scroll down, uh, it'll make the header zoom open a bit. A lot of people wonder how to do that. So there's a nice little example of how to do that. Okay. And in some way, which will be available to you through a link, uh, how we can take this. Um, maps. Mm -hmm. More and more apps benefit from having a map somehow. Uh, I've written four or five apps myself that have used maps directly. Um, it is a bit mysterious how to get Google Maps working <laughs> with maps sometimes. Uh, so this is a nice little worked example of how to do that. When you actually look at the code, which puts the map on the screen, it's like, how could anyone find that hard? Yeah. Um, but when you've got a full project, which actually has it fully integrated, then, then it means that you've got an example that you can compare with if you're having problems following instructions yourself. Um, one of the things that some people struggle with is how to decorate a map with things like a, an overlay yeah. search field and stuff like that. So yeah. uh, you can just use uh, absolute position overlays in React Native. Um, and um, you can make it so that you can that, that, uh, a view that overlays another view is transparent to clicks, except for the things which are inside ah. that view. And so that's a little trick which is illustrated quite well by this. Uh, we were going to do this on May the 4th. <laughs> do you know what day May the 4th is? It's Star Wars Day. And so I added a little example of how to use React Navigation uh, into the app. Um, which just lets you have a look at some Star Wars movie posters. Um, it's a good example of how to set up a stack navigator, navigator in React Navigation and use a couple of tools from a really nice library called React Native Limits. Um, so that just lets you um, have a look at how that's done. Um, we had a special request from someone not a million miles away from me uh, about how to do a camera app in React Native. And Actually, it's pretty, since you're close enough, I'll just show you. Um, so uh, this just is a little camera screen built into the app. It's also, you can probably hardly see it, it's also got a level that's dancing around the middle. It's actually watching the accelerometer on the gyroscope. So you, you've got a horizon built into it. I don't know how I can hold this, so you can see that. It's just a very thin line. Uh, but that illustrates how to use sensors and camera together um, in, a, in a single app. Um, that bottom image is from, uh, a Rick and Morty episode where Rick shows Morty what true level is. And I thought it was that was uh, Last one is a simple bar chart. A friend of mine uh, was writing an app where he had to produce a bar chart showing historical data um, for a, a company. And I helped him with that and thought this would be a good thing to add into my demo app as well. So, really, so, fine? Uh, no. It's uh, but it can fetch the data from oh. API. 
Um, it's just really starting, illustrating how to, how to code a bar chart um, without using it to public library to do it. Um, so I'll switch over to the code. The next few slides just show, have links to help you download stuff. Um, so we'll start with the um, simplest way to do an animation in React Native. Um, so on this screen, suspiciously called animation, we've got uh, a hot pink box. Hot pink is the actual color. Um, Hello, this is the first screen, and a button saying press me please. And what happens is that they swap positions. Wow. As you can see. <laughs> so the, all that's happening here is we're executing a couple of lines of code when we press this button. So the, um, the purpose of this screen is just to position these two elements and then to uh, allow this button press to change the state in a way which will be animated thanks to this one line of code. So uh, there's no need to write screens of code to um, go through um, um, all the frames of animation, you just keep the switch and the you just size the text for us. I will I will certainly do that. It's probably going to need a little keystroke, which will do it easily. Changes every day. Turn out the animation. Boom. Okay, here we go. Now I know it's a bit of a pain just kind of dropping you into a bit of code that's not familiar. So I'll show you what it's like actually developing a React Native screen from scratch and uh, so I've got a little tab here called play. Skip over a few of those and I'll bring back my, bring back my control view. So this is just a play screen. And if I get rid of all that content you might think, okay, let's create a React Native component. If the lights turn off here, someone has to wave their hands. No, it's going to be it's easier to see. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, um, a lot of people are using um, editors with snippets. I love snippets. Here's one of my favorite snippets. Boom. With oh. a bunch of your component. <laughs> um, and we'll give it a name. Um, play screen. Cheating. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so this is a very simple React Native component which has a style so I'll follow the I'm home control following the, the case on this, I'll just follow on this way. Um, so it's a very simple component which has a view that contains some text and it uses a style on that view which uses some flex flexbox parameters here which uh, expand it to the full size of the screen and position it in the middle. Oh, now, okay. when I'm playing with a component that I'm just writing off and just put a background color onto it so you can see yeah. the extent of it. Yeah, no. Don't. <laughs> cool. Thank you. That's, the thing. That's how you know it's live, folks. <laughs> Okay, so if um, I don't know how familiar some of you might be with uh, React Native, but the um, the structure of React Native application is more or less like a fractal. So everything that you see on the screen is a React Native component, um, down to the smallest thing and the largest thing. So the whole application can be thought of as a component, which contains of subcomponents, which contains of subcomponents, and so on and so forth. Um, the way you include a component in the screen is just to use this uh, angle bracket syntax. They look like HTML, but actually what's happening is the React library is interpreting that and turning it into a series of nested function calls. And what you end up with is a tremendously complicated nested structure of components, which the uh, at runtime, it looks for any differences between that and what your last render cycle produced and then only updates the screen with what's changed. So um, it's designed to allow you to declare the user interface um, in that form um, and write logic which, which manipulates it um, uh, according to what changes you want to see. <laughs> what is that using? Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a way of declaring, uh, it's a declarative approach to producing the UI. Mm -hmm. 
um, it uses um, something which looks like HTML, but is actually being interpreted uh, to produce uh, nested JavaScript calls, which so each one of those would turn into a create element. And what's the line that calls that? Which not the specific line that was calling the, the line that causes that to happen is the fact that we're importing React. Yeah. And so uh, for the but you haven't you haven't got a sub component on this yet. No, not yet. Um, so let me just play with this for a little bit, and I'll just uh, uh, I'll do something that's make it turn into yeah. something responsive. So let's use um, React hooks, and I'll make this a stateful screen. And I'd like to put a button on this, and then change the state based on whether we click that button. So if I say in the component, we'll declare a constant and we'll just call it pressed. And the way this works is we're going to ask use effect to produce this for us. And so it'll also give us a function which we can call to change the state. And we'll call that set pressed. Oops, use state. And Default to false. Okay. And now I'll just put a button underneath the text there. Uh, let's make it a nicer button. So I'll import button from React Native Elements. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> People will speed up their YouTube videos when they're live coding. <laughs> yeah. Do your takes. I bet. Not, you never see them do type posts. Um, another beer, you'll be okay. Thank you. You've heard of the Barman limit. It's a critical amount of alcohol that improves your performance as a programmer. Okay. Exclamation mark for that guy. No, a limit. All right. So there'll just be a button that doesn't do anything. And if I say give this an on press attribute, so this will call a function for us. We'll have an inline error function. And this guy's job will simply be to change that state. We'll say um, set pressed. We'll toggle it. So let's say set pressed is not pressed. <laughs> nice and easy. And it might be mysterious whether that's happened or not. So I'll put an extra bit of text, which just has text. Uh, this will just say press true or press false. And one more. It's orange. And that doesn't, I'll just make it so that they're spaced around a bit. This is Flexbox. The moment we're all sitting in the center of the screen, I'll just type to say these will be spaced around. That's a bit nice. Okay. So now, if I press this, it changes the state like that. So we've got now we've got an interactive screen. Um, oh, well, can you click again? They were in the middle of changes. It does, but uh, yeah. I wouldn't be very satisfied with that. I can tell that you're not very satisfied with that. So, um, <laughs> let, make, make it bold. I think we all make it. Well, I, I, I think we can change the color too. <laughs> so, um, let's uh, let's play with the style that we've got here. Thanks, folks. And I'm going to just add a color to this. And we'll have a bit of JavaScript. We'll have a, a, a ternary function. So we'll say, based on whether you're pressed, we will either, oh, sorry, we'll set the background color. So it takes advantage of the virtual DOM, is that, is that right? So That's correct, yes. Um, so I'll, I'll just finish typing this a little bit. So, so if it's pressed, we'll be the color. We have the last color. Hot pink. Hot pink. Thank you. 
I had a UX designer that worked with me, and, and uh, whenever she did a wireframe that didn't specify color, I'd choose hot pink and lime green just to illustrate that uh, there was something missing from the design that she needed to think about. Um, like well, fun. Depends on how Microsoft designs this. But... Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if we press, we'll have uh, background color set to lime, and if we're uh, we're not, we'll just stick with yellow. Spell correctly, and it'll work. Good. Yay. Those aren't sufficiently different. I, you know, I'd go for. I, I, I really should go for hot pink, shouldn't I? No, that's that's fine. There we go. All right. So we've added uh, simple states to this uh, reanimator screen. Um, uh, just wondering that. So you get an idea of the kind of code that you write to um, add states to a, uh, a screen. Um, so what I could do now is just get, show you, walk you through some of the code which is used for some of the other screens. I mentioned this um, shared element uh, animation before. This is actually two screens. Um, so we're going to navigate between them just by tapping on the image. On that. Oh, yeah. So you've got the same element on both. Mm. And I've said it so you can either close it by clicking here or it can uh, track the fact that the scroll view has been pulled down below a certain point that it snaps back. Um, so when you're um, scrolling down, yes. that's where you start shrinking the, the second view and then you disappear, uh, and then you change the opacity? Oh, wow. Yeah, so that, that's using a library called uh, React Native Reanimated, which is a more advanced way of doing animations. And so you can tie that into events generated by gestures and animations and events um, produced by a scroll view. So you can hook in uh, various uh, transitions uh, based on that. So you can have the opacity of the screen, we can apply um, a 3D scaling to something if we want to. Um, and uh, so that, that's really what's happening here. Does a lot of the animation here work happen in JavaScript, or is it CSS? Um, if it doesn't happen in CSS, um, but it's not quite true to say it happens in JavaScript either. Right. Um, well, yes, it does happen in JavaScript, but some of it's declarative. And um, the way a library, library like React Native Reanimated works is that you declare a set of rules which are sent across the bridge, so they're executed in native code space mm -hmm. at a very high frame rate. Yeah. And um, they'll get the, um, like that, that I mentioned earlier, between a scroll view's position and uh, animation, which controls that by capacity or, or the scaling factor applied to the screen. So that can happen um, in real time. So it's not really your main thread of JavaScript code that's being executed to cause that animation. You've just written a few lines of code to say that there's that link between those two things. So, um, so not in CSS. Um, more confused, that's all good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my goal is that um, the way it is for you, 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 you find Grand Ace is intriguing enough to have it yeah. into it a bit more deeply. Um, so, in this case, what we've got is um, a React Native screen, much like the last one that I put together in front of you. And um, I've just wrapped this part in, in a touchable component. So there's non press method there. Anything inside of it, um, if it's touched by the user, then it'll trigger that, but that is like a button. And what it contains is the special tag called shared element, which is part of the React Native shared, the React Navigation shared element library. Um, and the, the way that works is you just take the thing which is going to be shared between the two screens, in this case, an image. Of a beautiful sunset on the wider cover. Um, and um, when we navigate to the second screen, uh, it will find uh, another shared element which contains the same thing and make sure that those that, that they transition uh, smoothly between the two. So so that's about all there is to the screen. If I go to the second one, Again, not too complicated, but I think 
they, uh, the interesting thing here is that there's another copy of that image, which is also wrapped in a shared element of the same ID. And so it'll automatically handle the transition so that that happens quite smoothly. Um, and then I've just padded out the screen with a, a bit of text so it looks like it's uh, significantly different. And this whole thing is inside a scroll view, which I have um, gone to the trouble of attaching an animation to the on scroll event um, so that it will automatically reduce the size of that window as you pull down before it finally decides that it's going to navigate back. So the key thing is that you can have a shared element transition with just a few lines of code. And while well, it is a bit of pain working all that out, you guys have got a work example to play with. So uh, you can have it. This reminds me quite a bit of using the layout components. So you yeah. have one file that you can share across every page. Yeah. A little bit. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work that's going into um, making things as simple and maintainable as possible. And so the, the key takeaway here uh, is, is how little code is actually needed to produce the result. Um, OK, so we've got a few other things that we can uh, look at. Uh, are there any favorites? Um, just to be conscious that we need to be wrapping it up here. One more. <laughs> One more. OK. <laughs> Uh, so, well, I'm quite fond of the map, so if uh, yeah. there's no interest in the map, I'll just bring that. Okay, so this is the map screen. And there we go. All right, so this is pretty much it. So it's a very simple screen. First element on it, which is a style which makes it cover the full screen, is this map view. And it takes a few parameters. The key one is that this is a Google map. And the style that we've associated with this is very simple. It just makes it um, cover the whole screen, flex one, which means um, it'll, it'll use Flexbox to cover the whole screen. Um, and we've turned on a couple of features which are quite cool, like showing the user location. You might notice that the map is currently showing the UK, but if I bring it over to where we are, I've told the simulator to simulate a location somewhere in Auckland, and uh, so that, that is currently showing it. Um, yeah, that's uh, Richmond Road. And um, we've got, uh, I've used a custom map style um, there's actually a tool from Google which allows you to edit your own map style so you can do something that's distinctive and appropriate for like, like a theme. Sorry? Like a theme. Like a theme, yes. Okay. Uh, so I've just created one of those and, and uh, um, included it in this application and just, just used it uh, on this particular map. And then we've got the overlay. And um, this is within the same parent view. Uh, we've got a, another view, this, this time a safe area view, which is smart enough to avoid the notch at the top and the uh, little bar at the bottom of an iPhone. Um, and um, that uses absolute positioning, so it covers the whole of the screen. And uh, we've also got an attribute there called pointer events none, and that's the thing which tells it to be transparent to user touches. So. If we were to click on this, then that touch will be passed through that layer to, the, to what's underneath, unless there's something within the, this layer that we want to respond to touches, like the search bar. So if I drag around the map, that scrolls. If I touch the search bar, uh, then that takes the focus. And if I turn on my keyboard, then we can type in some data to it and hit search. But that isn't implemented here, so it just pops up and alert. <laughs> So that's a nice work example about how to use a map in a React Native application without too much trouble. Sorry, is, that, is that map view um, one of the React Native elements, or did you build that, that uh, component? So that, that's using a third party library which is community supported called React Native Maps. Uh, it's quite a versatile 
it uh, supports uh, Google Maps and Apple Maps. Um, if you ever had to pay a bill to Google for their services, you know that it can get pretty expensive. Um, it's, so it's quite nice being able to use Apple Maps with the same code base uh, and not have to pay any fees to Apple because it's free. Um, I've also done some work with a competing product from, uh, from Mapbox, which does really nice OpenGL-based uh, maps, which are beautiful to work with. But unfortunately, unfortunately, that isn't supported by this particular library, so there's a bit of learning to, to, for me to do to be able to make use of that. But um, uh, the key takeaway from this is that you can have a map in your application. So if you had like a couple of um, addresses in your map, let's say some parks, yeah. <laughs> and you need to locate them. Could you add pins to the map? Similar to what you're doing with the maps? And yeah, so um, I can't remember the exact syntax, and I, I, I recognize that we're um, getting a little, a little out of time. But if I open up this tag. It sounds like a, a, a test from India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's you can do. <laughs> just built our final project. Have and you? the main thing is map but we're using react and in the beginning of the project we considered using react native but because we didn't learn it yet we thought oh it might be too hard but now i'm thinking it might have been easier <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you might be right <laughs> so um the way the way the um matthew tag works is that if you put your children in it then they'll if they're uh, from the same library then it's not enough to be able to use those within the map uh, and so there's a tag called a marker and um, by default, we'll just use the Google sort of red pen, um, but you can substitute in image, any image you like. So you can, you can build your own Pokemon game, um, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you, you just populate um, what's inside the map you tag pair with whatever you'd like to put on the map. That would include not just markers, but uh, uh, polygons and other map features that you might work out how to draw on the client side and, and then uh, present to the user that way. Um, so is Apple Maps free? I always thought there was an API cost. Uh, not as far as I know. Um, oh. So, yeah, if you're, if you're running an iOS app. Do you get the full features or you get a bit of a custom down? I have to look into it, doesn't it? Yeah, if, if, they, were, if they were to charge, then it would probably be for um, things like uh, geospatial lookup features yeah. and stuff like that. Um, when, I, when I used a few years ago, it was uh, if you were you running your map inside a login, you had to pay a little bit after X amount of calls. Okay. Like, yeah. After a login. Yeah. Oh, okay. But uh, that was a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, of course, they changed. But it was like that. That's like okay. it. Um, Steve, I'm super conscious of the people that are, are cleaning. That's quite right. right. We're in outside, if you're so. interested in the slides or the source code, um, the easiest way to get hold of it is by grabbing. That and uh, that will give you a link to the slides, which includes that for COVID. Uh, <laughs> not, not today. Um, um, but yeah, we can. Uh, you will share it also in the meetup for sure. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Well, cool. no, guys, uh, if you have any ideas to make this better or. Uh, if you want to present something, please give me a message through meetup.com or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, we're looking for developers, so send me an email as well. Um, and well, thank you for coming. And <laughs> if you want to take quick second, do it. <laughs> thank you for coming. See you guys.